What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher, and on this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. Guys, real quick, before we begin, I want to quickly tell you about my new coaching program, Elite Property Foundations. It's officially launched as of the 1st of June, and it is now alive and kicking with members. If you are a novice property investor or you would like to be a property investor, this is the program for you. I guarantee it's going to take you from feeling nervous about what you're doing to being both highly knowledgeable and confident in your decisions. There's a load of features and benefits, so you should definitely check it out. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes below. That's all. I hope to see you inside. Now let's get on with the show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode. And this week, I am... I've still got my, I've got this damn cold that's kind of hanging on for the last three weeks or so, and it's proving difficult to shift. So I'm going to do a short enough episode, but I actually think you might find this one to be kind of impactful. And uh, I certainly hope it's going to be impactful. You see, a lot of people have been in contact with me. I get a lot of stuff over the social media. And uh, a lot of the time, what they want it'll be guys reaching out asking my opinion on a particular property that they're looking at or they'll be wanting to know you know should they buy in a certain area or how big of a mortgage should they you know opt to take out or whatever it might be and a lot of the time the criteria that these guys are using to assess whether or not they should buy this property is just simply whether or not they can afford it they don't do a lot of risk analysis they don't do a lot of reviewing of you know the different kind of uh, financial aspects of the deal and a lot of the time they don't even they're not even aware that this is the kind of financial analysis that we would do typically in uh, before we look at buying anything and so you know the the criteria they're using is can they raise the deposit and if they can they'll go ahead with the property purchase if they cannot then they won't or they'll make a bid for it, uh, they make an offer and maybe somebody else comes along and outbids them. But that is really the kind of extent of the evaluation that they do. And this is something that I want you guys to kind of think about is, uh, first of all, that whole approach, in my opinion, is wrong. What you should be thinking about whenever you look at a property, and it's almost, I won't say it's the exclusive consideration because obviously you've got to weigh up the risks and stuff, but what you should be really focused on is how much value can I add? Full stop. Can I add or create value through my own actions? And that is the only thing that you really should be you know, concentrating on. Because if you cannot see a clear path to how you're going to add value, then don't go ahead with the purchase. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, let's start with the most basic version. And most of you will be familiar with the, the term B or, or, or. And this comes about in the kind of the residential property context. And what it is, is you buy, you refurbish, you rent, and then you refinance. And that is a kind of a tried and tested formula that a lot of people do. You find an older property, you modernize it. So how are you adding the value? Well, you're upgrading things like the kitchen, You might put in new bathrooms, you might repaint it, carpet it, you know, put new curtains up, whatever it might be. Perhaps you go so far as to improving the insulation in the attic and maybe you improve the energy performance of the building or something like that. That's nowadays that's starting to kind of come into uh, into focus. And so those are the kind of things that I would be looking at if I was looking at residential fixer offers. And what you would hopefully do is you go in, you take the property, and without doing a massive amount of work, maybe you spend thirty to forty thousand all in to do all of that work. Some people will, you know, opt for a bigger house and they might have to spend more. Some people will be looking to extend it, and so they have to actually, you know, put up concrete blocks and stuff. So obviously that's going to be larger. But generally speaking, you can get in and out with maybe thirty to forty thousand. And what you would hope to do 
is that by spending that 30 to 40,000 that you have added value to the property in the region of maybe say 60 to 70,000, maybe 80,000. And so you're looking at potentially 30,000 investment in and a return of 30, 40, maybe 50,000 back. And that is in its kind of sim most simple form. That is what I mean by adding value. It's a, you know, it's, it's tried, it's tested. A lot of people can get their head around that. It's not very sophisticated. You don't need to have, you know, any kind of a deep understanding of the planning system or anything like that. It's really just, if you know how to put in a kitchen, you can do a lot of this kind of work yourself. There would be guys out there that are in the trades business, if you're an electrician or if you're a plumber, that you could do a lot of this work yourself and you end up adding the value through your own efforts. And so this can be quite a you know lucrative way of going about it. And if you don't know, like if that description that I've just gave you uh, of how you go about all of this, if that does not sort of sound like a logical pro, you know, process, and if it's all a little bit above your head how to do it, well then I definitely think you should check out my foundation course, which is it's the basic novice investor course that I offer. And I'll put a link down in the show notes, but that has all of the kind of explanation of how all of that stuff works. But let's get into a slightly more sophisticated version. And I'm not talking about like massively sophisticated. What I'm talking about here is simply adding value through say the planning system. And there's ways to do this. And if you go back and have a look at um, like people are, when they're thinking about residential property, you buy something for say 150,000, you spend 30,000 on it and you maybe you've added 50. So you've increase the value by about 25%. But let's have a think about, you know, the more ambitious people out there who would be looking at buying a property and doubling its value or tripling its value. How do you go about doing that? And this is not easy to do in residential because residential property is usually based, the value is usually based on the surrounding areas. So you, unless you can you know, lift the house up and move it to a different location, you're not gonna double the value. However, with commercial property, that is possible. But in addition to that, if you just take a piece of land on its own, I'm gonna give you an example. My first ever property deal was back when I was in my early 20s, I found a plot of land in the west coast of Ireland, and it was in a town called Enniscrown which is kind of a seaside town in Sligo. And, um, you, you know, those of you who live on the West Coast might know this area. It's, it's a good place for surfing and things like that. But I bought this little plot of land. It was about one acre. So when I say little, it wasn't a small piece of land. It was an acre of land. But it was an acre of land that only cost me 25000 Now, back in my 20s, that was probably, you know, represented quite a sum of money for me but we're not talking about hundreds of thousands. We're talking about 25 grand for one acre of land. And I bought that and it had, at the time, it had cattle grazing on it. So it was just resident, it wasn't residential land zoning. It was zoned for residential, but it did not have any planning permission. And it was just sitting there in this village being used by the local farmer to graze cattle. And I came along and because I had architecture, uh, I had studied architecture, I was able to do the drawings and I was able to apply for planning permission myself. Now, this is not something that an architect would charge a lot for. Uh, so, you know, you don't need to be an architect to go and do this kind of thing. But it, I can remember I went and I applied for four houses on this, four detached houses on this property. And I went for the planning, submitted all the drawings, and I went through the process. And after, you know, maybe... It's usually eight to 12 weeks. And at the end of that process, I got planning permission. And the planning permission said that I could go ahead and I could build these four houses on this one acre of land. Now, I put it up for sale and I didn't actually intend to sell it. But what I did was I approached a local auctioneer. This local auctioneer, his name was Philip McComiskey. And uh, I asked Philip how much could I expect to sell each of these four houses when I've built them? And he said he'd go off and he'd get some prices for me. And he went off and what he actually did was he approached a client of his and he said, I have a ready to go 
site for four houses. Would you like to buy it? And Philip came back to me a week later and he said, Gavin, uh, I have something for you. And I thought he was going to give me the prices of, you know, what each house after I built it would be worth. And instead he said, Gavin, uh, I spoke to a builder client of mine and the builder doesn't want to build the houses for you. He just wants to buy the site with the planning permission as you have it there. And he's willing to give you 125 grand to just sell him the site. Now I can remember I had owned this property for more, no more than six months. <clears throat> I had paid 25 grand for it. And here I have added 100,000 of profit to this property just by getting planning permission for uh, and, and not actually having built the houses, simply getting the permission to build the houses. And that's just six months of work, L less even, you know, we'll say, we'll say three to four months of work. So that strategy you would call planning game. And that is where you take a property and you change the use of the property or you simply get planning permission on the property. And that action of getting a permission adds value. And this is typically, you know, what we would actually do nowadays, the, the, the house building side of, of our business, we would actually continue to use this strategy but instead of going for planning permission and getting and then selling it with the benefit of planning we would actually add the value to the land and then we will go ahead and we'll actually build the houses and we'll sell the houses so in that instead of it being a single step and selling it with permission we would actually go to the second stage where we'd actually build it out as well but for those of you who don't want to get into all of that stuff who don't want to get into development who don't want to get into you know the risky set aside of building and stuff like that the possibility of getting planning permission for a piece of land and adding value to it and then just selling it with the benefit of that that can be quite a lucrative way to go and as you can see in that case what i bought for 25 i sold for 125 um, so that's a 4x increase in the value of the property a 5x if you include my original investment now, another example, which would be also very lucrative and one that I used in the past was what I call the subdivision um, strategy. And so the first one that we've just explained there, that was the, the planning gain strategy. And the second one was the development where you actually go ahead and build it. The, subdivi the, the subdivision strategy is actually very, very simple, um, but you do need to kind of be a little bit more experienced for this, but I'll give you a, the exact example. I remember back in, you know, back in the kind of mid 2000s, I found a retail unit in uh, West Dublin. And I can remember it was an oversized retail unit. It was way too big for the, uh, for the kind of clients that you would want to put in there. So if you go and look around and open your eyes when you're, you know, walking into, we'll say a convenience store, or if you go into an off license, or if you go into a Domino's pizza, or if you go into a you know petrol station or anything like that, uh, you will notice that convenience stores are usually of a certain size. They have so many shelves. They sell you know the products, the newspapers. They sell you know they'll have a shelf with all the the you know they might sell some wine, they might sell some beer, but usually there are only so many shelves that they have. So they're not massive units. Um, if you go into a off license. They will have the wine stacked up to the roof. They will have, you know, uh, crates of beer and you can go and buy all these different products. They will be of a certain size. You go into a Domino's pizza uh, to go and order your takeaway pizza. You stand at the front desk and there's only like maybe a meter of space between you and the desk. And then you'll see all the guys kind of in the room behind preparing the pizza and stuff when they have the oven and stuff. But it's not a huge amount of space. So that is your typical size retail unit. I remember discovering this piece of uh, retail unit that was much bigger. It was about three times larger than what I've described there. And I kind of thought to myself, who is going to ever go and you know rent a unit that's this size? And if they do rent a unit this size, they're going to expect a much, uh, a big discount on the rent because it's such a large unit. 
So I came along and I split the unit into three different smaller units. And I went out to those exact people I've described. I looked for the convenience store. I looked for the off license. I looked for the um, pizza uh, takeaway. And I also went to one of the bookmakers. And what we did is, I'll, I'll explain the exact steps that we took here. The first thing is buy the property. And I can remember, took possession of the property and it had one electrical distribution board. It had one water point for connecting your taps to. It had one uh, sewer outlet for connecting your toilet to. And that was it. So it was pretty simple and it was a huge big open space. And what we did was we went in for planning permission to divide it into three smaller units. Built, uh, w went in, applied for that, got the planning permission for that. It took, again, eight to 12 weeks. The decision came in and then the next stage. So step one, planning gain. As soon as we had the units split into three, um, there was already an increase in the value of that property. But the next stage was, now that we have permission, let's go ahead and actually do the work to subdivide the unit. So that did not take much work at all. We got us a local builder to go in uh, with a load of concrete blocks and cement, and they went and they built two walls that split the one large unit into three separate units. And then what they did was they got, we got an electrician in and the electrician split so that instead of there being one distribution board and one power supply, there was now three power supplies in the three different, one in each of the different units. The water supply was, you know, terminated in one particular part of the big unit. We split that, we chased up the floor, so we created a bit of a kind of a trench. And what we did was we put pipes that went from that point into the other two units. So we now had three points in, uh, one in each unit. And then finally, um, the power was distributed. The, the toilet, um, we, we put like a, a sewer pipe into each of the units. So each unit would have its own toilet. And that was it. Simple enough. I think the total amount of time to do all of that was maybe two weeks of work. And suddenly, we now have got three separate units that have their own power, their own water, and their own sewage connection. And the next thing then was, what are we going to do? That was step two. We had now done the subdivision. Step three was where it got just a little bit more sophisticated. We decided to go and try and rent these units. And so this was where we appointed uh, an estate agent that deals in commercial property, does retail kind of stuff. And this, these guys, I happen to know one of them. I met him on site, walked around the unit, and he said, okay, target market is, and he started naming off all these different operators. So you've got your Domino's Pizza, you've got your off-license operators, you know, there'll be a lot of familiar names that you guys will all be very familiar with because if you go down to your local uh, community or your local neighborhood center or whatever, there will be the same brands that you're used to seeing there. There'll be the convenience store, that's either Spar or Centra or Mace or whatever it is. There'll be a, if there's a bookies, it'll be Paddy Power Bookmakers. It'll be some other bookmaker that you're familiar with in your area. Uh, there'll be an off license. It might be O'Brien's, it might be Galvin's, whatever it is. And that's what happens. These guys, these agents will go and they'll approach all of those different people and they will go and they will promote the location and they'll promote the unit and the opportunity. So that was the next step. And we went out there and we did that. We marketed for probably about four months. And in that period of time, <clears throat> we found the various people that were interested. And I started to build up relationships with the decision makers in those different companies, which itself was useful because then you can take those relationships and you can use them to replicate it in another location. But what I can remember was we eventually got those three units Le leased and we got them leased up to the uh, to the different businesses that were going to go in and they were going to start using them as retail units and I didn't have to spend much money at all at this stage I had bought the unit I had got the planning permission I had done the little bit of work inside to go and subdivide and next I was renting it out to these guys 
And these guys were saying, what about a shop front? Now, I didn't have any shop front. This unit had been handed over to me with just the timber sort of facade. Like they basically, it had like just some carpenter had gone and built like a timber wall, we'll say. And that was there. And what you were to do is you were to remove that and you were to put up a proper glass uh, shop front. And what we would say is, we're not going to put in any of that, but what we will do is in return for um, the, you know, the, the, us not having to do that for you, we will give you six months rent free. And so that was a, a, an acceptable deal. These guys would go and they'll put in the shop front themselves. They put in their security features, their shutters, whatever they need. And they would do all of that work. And in return for that, we would give them six months rent free. Some guys would, you know, demand more. Maybe they want nine months or whatever. But that's down to a negotiation. And it depends on the strength of the cards that you've been dealt. If the unit is like the last unit and there's a couple of people trying to get into it, then obviously you can play hardball. But if it's the first unit that you're trying to get and you're trying to get all three of them away, then you have a slightly less um, of, a, of a card to deal. So what's the next stage? You get those units fully rented, you get them open and trading, and after a while they start trading, people are going in, buying their groceries, doing all of their bits and bobs. And what you want to do is you want to have what we call income stabilization. And so that is you hold on to the units until the rent-free period has expired. So in this case, uh, nine, six months later, nine months later, whatever it is, now we have all of the income coming in every three months in, from each of the tenants. So now it is a performing investment. And so what is stage four? Stage four is put the three units that are now fully performing investments up for sale on the market. So the same estate agent that I used they also turned out to be uh, guys that were actually able to sell the investment as well. So we started a marketing campaign to sell the investment. We put it up for sale as either one lot for all three or three lots where somebody could come along and just buy the one unit that they want to invest in. And we put them on the market. And that period of time probably took in the region of maybe three months of a marketing period. So, you know, you're, you're, you're showing people around, you, you've produced a brochure, you've done all this kind of stuff, and then you go and you ask people, right, we're gonna want to get, you know, best bids by a certain date. And we ended up getting the bids in. So how did it all work out? So I bought an, <coughs> excuse me, I bought an oversized unit, and the total I paid for that unit was 680,000 euro. I spent about 20,000 on the subdivision works and uh, you know maybe five or 6,000 on the planning permission. So total investment there, about 705,000. Now, we also have to pay the agent that we used. So we would have paid the agent to rent the three units and we would have paid the agent for the sale of the investment in the end. So I would estimate that we probably paid out between 50 maybe and 70,000 in fees to that agency. And the total end uh, price that we sold was 3.75 million. And so the total investment in the property, including the fees for the disposal and everything, in the region of 775,000, sale price at the exit, 3.75. So basically 3 million profit made. And the time frame involved, I would say a, somewhere between two and two and a half years all in from purchasing the property to having the money in the bank, about two and a half years. And so that was a really lucrative deal. I mean, that was a, a phenomenal deal, but it was not that sophisticated really. I mean, if you think about what we did there, it's quite easy. There was four steps. There was the planning permission, there was the subdivision, there was the rental, and then there was the sale of the investment. And so that there is that strategy. That was adding the value. Somebody was selling an oversized unit that nobody wanted, and I turned it into three smaller units that everyone wanted. And then when they were performing as investments, they were definitely wanted because we sold that at a, at a yield of about maybe 5%. Now, all of this, you know, 
this, of course, is it's not something that you could necessarily go out and replicate in the morning. And I certainly have examples of deals that I did where I tried to replicate that and it didn't, you know, some aspect of it didn't work or there was mistakes made. And, you know, all of this stuff I've actually learned from my lessons. Like any mistakes that I made when, in the past, those now form part of the curriculum of the of the programs that I do now so that you guys, if you do happen to join a program of mine, that you're not going to go and fall into the same, you know, uh, minefield as I did but it doesn't take a huge amount of brain power to do this kind of stuff but you have to be aware of the opportunities you have to be aware of the potential and you have to be aware of just what's possible out there and so definitely if you're interested uh, the courses and the programs and stuff that I do I do teach all of that stuff how that's possible and so I'll go and I'll stick a link down below if you want to check out in the show notes now, there are loads and loads of different strategies, and some of them are more complicated than others. And there's definitely, I mean, uh, some. it's funny, I was just chatting with a client of mine recently, and this is a guy that I think he paid maybe 4,000 for one of, to, to join my accelerator. And he's been, he was telling me the last time I was speaking to him that from one conversation that we had, he went out and he changed the layout of uh, a property that he owned. And by changing the layout of that property, he added 30,000 to the value of the property. So that is an example of just simple, you know, intelligent reorganizing, reorganizing or a slight, you know, sort of strategic change of the way a room is configured or the way, you know, you could maybe turn a place from a four bedroom into a five bedroom without doing a huge amount of work and so there's little strategies like that that can be quite lucrative and yet they're they're not complicated and so guys i hope you're finding this uh just opening your eyes a little bit and making it a little bit easier to see that the real strategy is adding value it's not just buying a property to have the rental income it's actually how do i go about adding the value so that I actually have got, I've created equity in the deal. And if I decide to hold on to this property long-term, I will have the rental income, which will be nice. But even better than that would be that should I decide to sell it in the morning, that I actually will get all of my investment back plus a, a tidy profit. So um, what I'm actually going to do, guys, I've been thinking about this, and I know there's a lot of people out there listening to this podcast who own property. Now, there's a lot of people out there who obviously would like to buy property and a lot of those guys have joined some of my uh, novice investor courses. But for those of you who actually own property and you're wondering, is there ways to add value to it? I'm actually prepared to have a conversation with you if you're interested, um, where we would just, now it's not a long conversation, we maybe spent 15 minutes on the phone or something, but if you can just you know, describe what you own describe the kind of property that you're sitting on, we might be able to find ways to add value as I've described this evening. And uh, the idea here is just finding the low hanging fruit. Obviously, if you are looking to do something more complicated that involves getting permissions and all that kind of stuff, that's a longer conversation. But the low hanging fruit might be something that is of interest to you. So guys, I'll put a link in the show notes below if you would like to book that 15 minute conversation with me uh, i would suggest that you only do it if you actually own property because we can i can i can really help you if you own something but if you don't own something and you're looking at something there's too many variables there that could get in the way and like somebody else could come along and buy it and so there's no point in having that conversation too early so guys, I hope you uh, could tolerate my blocked nose and my congestion. I hope you found this one as impactful as I hope it was. And at least at the very minimum, I hope it's got you thinking about the investment process and whether or not you've been thinking about it correctly, whether or not you can add that value. And guys, I'll see you again next week. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover in future episodes, please connect with me via the Facebook group. 
that is called Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, you will find me on social media. My handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. You can stay up to date with all of my content and the various projects I'm working on over on my website, GavinJGallagher.com. And while you're there, please do add your name to the Join My Tribe thing over on the right-hand side. This will ensure you're kept up to date via my weekly newsletter. All of these links are in the show notes below. That's all for now. I will see you guys in the next episode.